the reflection of the light. And I think that uh, it's like kind of like individual contact. So if you can just like um, come and see by yourself, that would be really nice.
to my father because my father was uh, an extreme bon vivant and he was always singing and always uh, creating a little poems and uh, so I, I think I was really influenced by him. However, I was like hyperactive uh, child so uh, I remember that I first of all started to, uh, to draw and paint uh, when I was sick. So when I was uh, <laughs> in my bed and I couldn't go out, I was, and I was often sick. So, so I was then uh, painting. And I was painting, of course, um, mimic, uh, mimicking other artists, uh, great masters. So my paintings, they were figurative totally, and then little landscapes. And um, with age, of course, I mean, I had like lots of other interests and uh, my main focus was uh, philosophy, political philosophy, I finished political science and I was completely fascinated by medieval history and uh, heretical movements. So I spent 10 years on researching uh, the heretical movement in Qatar, in Qatar, in the south of France. And uh, it was like one of the greatest adventures of my life. <laughs> I went to Carcassonne, I spent a lot of time and, and uh, I wrote my thesis and a book and uh, I, I made lots of research in many places, including Oxford as well. And in fact, that was in Oxford when you have this space when, <laughs> I know that would sound really, really strange, but uh, it's a little bit like in doing residency at OMI when, um, when everybody are doing everything for you, for you to work. So, and it happened like that. I mean, we had just like space to go for classes and writing and, and I started to paint actually. I mean, besides writing and doing my research. And when I go back from Oxford to, uh, to Krakow, it was crazy. I started like painting like, like really a lot and abstract because I had this like vivid visions. So uh, I guess that was, um, that was the, 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 the right moment and right space. But I have to say that I was also influenced by, by, by Venice Binale and Richard Serra. So when I saw Richard Serra sculptures in 2001, I was just like transported to the other realm. I thought, this is incredible. I felt like going, you know, through this like, I felt like I lost, I was lost in time and space somehow. And uh, when I came back, I remember I came back to Oxford, I was talking to Professor Bruce, he said, oh, Joanna, I don't think that you will be sticking to political science. <laughs> so, and he was really right. So, um, yeah, that was, and then it's actually, it's very important for me because then, uh, I am, so I was, extensively working on, on, on my paintings and I was teaching at university crazy stuff, I mean like uh, political science and, uh, and uh, the theory of uh, international relations and, and uh, history of political thought but also I had very interesting uh, courses uh, like history of uh, 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 rejected ideas so all heretic, heretics or dissident uh, movements from the um, uh, uh, the, the ancient time until uh, until today, for example. And uh, just ju just I'm thinking about Venice. In 2007, I think, or 2006, I went to uh, uh, Peggy Guggenheim collection, uh, and I saw the uh, exhibition of Richard Cusetta. And that was something incredible because I, I never thought, I mean, I had just these dreams, you know, because life at university, you know, because you are a professor, you know, it's very, very busy. And especially uh, when you have another like life, like painting, for example, it's, it's like two different, I would say, Worlds, so so it was impossible for me really to 
to paint because I have to work a lot uh, on students' papers, preparing for classes, etc. So I couldn't paint for one year and I remember that I was like dreaming that I was an island, on an island working, working with a master. And it was like so, I was so curious. So I, I was like thinking, oh my God, I mean, what's going on, you know? So my unconscious life, my dream life was like so strong that at some point in 2007, uh, I quit the university, uh, work at university and I decided to become a painter. So like, consciously, I was a painter, but like full-time painter. And I didn't have any idea how I would do that. And it was like, I didn't have money, I didn't have any connections, I didn't know anybody, you know. And uh, two years later, you know, I had my first exhibition at National Museum in Szczecin. That was my first exhibition ever. So the story is a little bit crazy. <laughs> also a story. Uh, the story that you've just been telling us happens in a lot of different places. In <clears throat> Poland, where you were born, in France, where you did yes. a lot of academic research, in Oxford, in Venice, and um, and when when you were talking about, I didn't realize that Richard Serra, that, like seeing Richard Serra's sculptures, was so important for you. And in some ways. He would be like one of the last artists I would associate with your work. Yeah, me too. Your work, you know, <laughs> there's the, the delicacy um, of surface, and the, there's a sense of a kind of quiet, meditative um, stillness that, uh, which maybe, maybe we can talk about this a little later, may have some connection to uh, ideas of, from the Middle Ages, from medieval. Um, religious ideas, but anyway, but so Richard Serra seems to me uh, interesting. Like, I, I was going to ask you, like, what, particularly because you had this sort of, uh, you know, vision on the road to Damascus, as it were, like, you know, changing your life, but I was going to ask you if there was a particular exhibition or artist that um, really changed things for you, so it's interesting that it should be Richard Serra. Um, Richard, you said your art makes Richard, a lot more sense. Yeah, Richard, you uh, said that yeah. I was already, I had already my style. Mm -hmm. I mean, I could say, I mean, a, a certain, I, I had already, when I saw the, the, the exhibition of the Jarku Sadat, I was just shocked because I was with my mother and she said, oh my gosh, his paintings are so similar to yours. I mean, it's a, of course, it's a reverse. <laughs> But uh, but yeah, I felt like I, I, I found like a like a brother soul, you know, and especially in his late uh, paintings. And even we had like similar titles, like he had like a spirit of the night, and I had like spirit of nature, you know, because we are both so much connected with nature, and of course not like the the, the stone or the grass or the tree but this like vibrational aspect, invisible aspect of nature, also of, of light. So, so that was, and I think the, the, the I, I, I was like, I can't even buy his, his catalog because I didn't want to be influenced by him. And after this exhibition, I slightly uh, stopped doing circles, for example, because I was completely, um, huh, I, I was, I was, I was really, I, I was like a um, maniac doing the circles and circles and infinity, infinity. It was like I saw circles everywhere, you know. It was so at, at some point I decided, okay, basta with circles. And then one day, <laughs> one day. I looked at my paintings with dots because, you know, there is another uh, series that I am doing with dots, you know, the series with field and also elements. And then when I see, of course, dots, there are little circles, you know, so my circle mania, you know, didn't really finish, so. Um, so these were Richard Pusat Art, Richard Sarah, both American artists, and you are Polish. And I wonder, um, was the history of modernist art 
love and was painting in full and something that you were aware of as you were growing up, or is it is that are 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 there modernist Polish artists who've been influential or important to you? And I also ask that because it's a history I think that's not as well known in this country as it could be or should be. And I just wonder whether that has like is there anything like if you're talking to uh, a viewer of your work uh, here in New York, is that you know, is there something that would help inform our understanding of where your work is coming from by knowing something about 20th century Polish art or not? Not really. Not, not really. Right. I mean, I, I can, I can, uh, I can say something. I mean, I, uh, of course, I was interested in history of art, you know, and also in high school, I, I, I was considering going to, to the university studying history of art, but, but uh, Polish art was for me more like uh, you know i stopped at, at some somehow my interest of art like before war maybe a little bit after so so i was not really influenced by, by art and i didn't have a lot of contact uh, with art frankly now you know when i started uh, to to paint then i i saw art and you know i was like more more attentive but uh, I, that was just coming really from me and from i guess also observing nature i mean and and uh, the process of processes of nature but not like um, passing this directly to to my art but like transforming it in this kind of like in the understanding of the invisible sources of nature. Well, I think your painting has, it's like it, it, it confronts the contradictions of materiality and immateriality. And I think a lot of the things you're interested in are, you know, are immaterial, are uh, things that, that are invisible. And yet you are trying to achieve them or have some kind of access to them through and something that's so material, I think that's like an interesting, maybe like an essential contradiction in painting, certainly in your, your painting. Um, I was struck the kind of experiment which you just uh, had us do here with going around and looking at the paintings with um, the lights from the phones. One that reminded me of a really fantastic, crazy exhibition that the artist David Hammonds did in New York in the mid 90s at Ace Gallery. It was this space at that time, which was on Hudson Street near Canal in an old renovated longshoreman's hall. It was this series of huge cavernous uh, exhibition spaces, galleries. And when you walked into the, uh, the opening, all the lights were off in the entire um, gallery. And in the corner, in the corner was a, was a, uh, like a some container filled with these little tiny, um, flashlights, like the kind you would have on your keychain, mm -hmm. uh, little blue lights. And so in order to see this exhibition, one had to take, each person took one of these blue lights and began venturing out into these like dark spaces. You had no idea where you were going or what you were looking for what? or what you would find. And that was the show. I mean, it was just, it was looking and looking. And it was that, you know, that sense of the, you know, the, like, what is art and where is like, you know, is it equivalent to the object or to what extent is it equivalent to the object? So I was, I thought that was an interesting reminder. Yeah, but what you, saying, uh, what, what you are saying, what you are saying, it sounds really wonderful because then you have this like, like immediate contact with, with art, like this experience, it's like, it's what, what we really want. Yeah, it's like individual contact and you have to go closer, you know, and you are, Focus on the art because everything is dark. Mm -hmm. So that that's, that that must be very very uh, interesting. But I really like your your um, description about materiality and immateriality because because yet yeah, this is true. I am playing with this materiality, immateriality with light. Light uh, light is immaterial. It's it's 
this, these paintings are kind of like changeable, you know, and, and like they don't like the mixed light. They, they look different in the mixed light, the daily light, and different in the darkness with the artificial light. So, and the, the light, the reflection of light plays enormous. Um, yeah, it's very important in, in my art. Well, I mean, the other thing I thought of is the irony of looking at these paintings with um, phones, which of course have cameras in them. And I think one of the things about the paintings is that they're incredibly resistant to, their, to, the, to photography and camera. Impossible. And so, like, and that's, you know, I think, like, sometimes we forget about that, is that, you know, because we're so used to looking, to experiencing a painting through, uh, through a photograph. And I just, this might, maybe if you talk a little bit about your process, but also about the fact that, well, I mean, to you, how important is it to you that your paintings are not, I mean, it's the problem that they're not easily photographical. They don't, you know, they, we see a sort of a version of them in a photograph, but the essence is escaping. And what are the, like, how do you deal with that? And how is that something that you set out to do or just happen in your process? And also, if you could talk, if you're willing to, to talk about your process. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I like that the person needs to be really present and needs to be with the painting because very often in, in this era we just go through the paintings on our phones you know it's like yeah i, I remember i met with simon de Puri at zahenta in poland once and he he told me so show me your work you know on the phone so i, I was like oh my gosh I mean, but this painting they need to be really seen in person it, it, you will just like go through them and you will not see the essence of it. So, <laughs> so yeah, that's, that's, the, that's the problem because, you know, in, the, in this like uh, fast life now, you know, it's very difficult to attract someone, you know, like tell someone, please come to my studio or to the exhibition and see the painting and be with them. So, you know, uh, I think that this, the, but this, but the, the 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 presence is very important. So the the photography is not working at all. I mean, it gives just one side of the story, but the real experience is when the the the, the viewer is present with the artwork. But that's what it should be, I guess. You know that that's what it's supposed to be. So. Um, about the process, yeah, I, I have like different uh, phases also of, of my work. So my early paintings, they are like very uh, painterly, I would say. I mean, they have lots of layers. They are, uh, they have lots of structures, and color is very very important. More important, I guess, than than today. I mean, color is always very important, but also, another aspect of my paintings is important for me, the light. So, uh, which is also connected, of course, with the color. But, uh, so, I feel like I'm going uh, towards less and less, you know. So, <laughs> it's like going also with my uh, focus of, on nothingness, but that's another story, it's a more philosophical concept that I am trying to explore for some time and it's connected with my research on history of religion from going from, from you know, 15 years ago or so, something like that. This, this painting, th these uh, particular paintings are, uh, are, are gravitational paintings, uh, so they're pouring paintings, but uh, pouring paintings from the bottom and they are made with uh, uh, oil paint uh, uh, mixed with a lot of turpentine or gamsol and a lot of, of um, uh, mica, so the, the golden pigment. But it's... Uh, so when you say mm -hmm. 
gravitational field from the bottom of the field. Mm -hmm. so yeah, it's, it's a mysterious process. <laughs> but, um, well, we can't just like review everything. <laughs> well, in fact, I don't want to pry your, your studio secrets out. But this, this is, for me, this is like a kind of like a gardening. I mean, I know it sounds crazy. But what I'm doing with these paintings, it's like working with nature, actually. I mean, we say, no, what is this? It's like working with, working with the aspect of nature, the gravitation aspect. And uh, as uh, Michel Vivi beautifully described in her essay uh, during our last exhibition at Isabel she said that like everything can play a uh, role uh, in this process, like changes of the temperature, uh, flow of the wind, of the air. Uh, everything has different property in different countries. So we have different pigments in Poland, we have different pigments in, uh, in the States, we have turpentine different kind of turpentine have come so here in, in which is great in so everything plays the role and um, like I am doing this in a certain uh, like state I would say like saying that it's like active meditation would not really work either uh, but this is kind of like flow I mean flow meaning that your brain just like pass to another kind of dimension. It's like a shift, you know. So and in that moment, you know, you know when you have this quality, the right quality of energy to do the painting. If I don't have that, I can do it. I can spend like three months doing one painting and it's not working if I am not in a good shape. Meaning that me, as a gardener, I have to be in good shape <laughs> and to have the right uh, other elements of nature in order to create the, 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 the painting. So my work is like to, to do the gesture, but then there are other invisible forces involved. So at some point when I do the gesture, like in Japanese calligraphy, you know, or uh, Chinese calligraphy, uh, then I step back and just wait. So I do a part of the work, and another part is everything what is going around. I don't know if I'm clear enough because this is a very mysterious process. I am, I am really always amazed. Sometimes it's just perfectly, you know, going. We are tuning with all elements together, and sometimes it's just a must. Well, in these paintings here, um, there are some really distinct differences, but I can see, you know, through the process, you also create these images that are evocative of nature, and um, you know, you think about river systems and the veins in the leaf and. So, like, even though you're not trying to represent nature, but you're thinking about it, and there are ways in which, just through the process, through your engagement, of letting, allowing materials to take their natural course, you end up in a kind of almost fractal way, creating images that are referencing and become part of nature. Uh, but there's also like a lot of variety. In it. I think mm, these paintings are. Is one looks at them carefully, they're like each one is quite different. Mm -hmm. And they're also, if you talk about gesture, we tend to think about gestures somehow like kind of very distinctive and sort of the mark of the artist, and we can recognize the artist's gesture. And I think with your work, there's a, you know, there's, it, there's something kind of anonymous and impersonal about the work. And like we don't, it's, because I don't see like, there's no obvious trace of the hand. These are obviously hand-made things. They're very, very carefully made, but there, it doesn't, you know, there, there, there's something kind of muted and quiet and not you know, kind of declarative in terms of what we think about gesture. 
And I think maybe part of it is just that kind of the small, tiny details that you're able to achieve in paintings. Um, I was just thinking about when we were talking, um, I guess a couple of weeks ago, I, uh, I was reminded, of, I told you I was reminded of an essay by uh, an art historian, art critic, Leo Steinberg, that's about uh, Jackson Pollock, and he's writing about Pollock's work in 1955, and he describes this conversation he has with uh, painter Paul Brock, and, um, and Brock is saying that how the sort of the role of the person, the people who become artists change from uh, era to era, from civilization to civilization, and he was saying that the kind of person who would have become uh, an artist in the Middle Ages, uh, where people were, the artist was kind of expressing and embodying common myths and the, you know, the common beliefs of the people, in the 20th century would more likely have become a movie director or, or maybe work in advertising. Whereas the kind of person who becomes an artist in the 20th century, like Jackson Pollock, in the Middle Ages would have been an alchemist. And I thought that that I was that was your work reminded me of that uh, conversation and that analogy and this idea of also because of the connection to the Middle Ages, but also this idea of artists pursuing something that is um, not just about image making, it's about having kind of endowing the materials of the process with a sort of quasi or mystical belief and that seems to be something that you're thinking about, no? Yes, yeah, th this is not this is this is very interesting. It's it's totally uh, interesting because I think I think that uh, all artists are simply, or not, maybe not all, but most of artists are simply alchemists. They are doing this transformational process, transforming bits and pieces, you know, and like daily life things, you know, to something extraordinary. And um, I think that alchemy is a very complex and very, very tricky subject um, and also I think that uh, alchemists uh, in the past they would be scientists uh, like astrophysicists or brain uh, like uh, scientists um, and actually lots of artists are interested in, in science. As, and I think that the, the, the interesting uh, comparison with alchemists are that alchemists, they really pushed uh, science forward. And uh, I think... Like the, the alchemy and science, the line between them is... is yeah, I mean, chemistry came from alchemy. I mean, medicine, also, you know, is, is it was very close to it. So there is like, like um, push, you know, by really looking for different things, of course. Yeah, so philosophical stone, you know, and, and we can think about material, but also uh, spiritual aspect. And uh, Jung was extremely. Uh, interested in, uh, in alchemy and uh, he thought that alchemy is, is a solution for, for a religion because many religions they miss something like Catholic uh, religion for example and uh, but I don't want to go into, <laughs> into the, this but, but I think that artists, philosophers, poets, writers, creative people they are alchemists, like like today alchemists, and they push push the boundaries, and they they look further, and they they really uh, you know by thinking creatively push civilization forward. So that I'm sure about that, and. Um, 
Yeah, I think, <laughs> for example, there is. A, I'm very much interested in in couple of people, and one of them is uh, uh, Kitaro Nishida. It's, uh, it's a Japanese philosopher, and he was actually very much interested in in nothingness, and um, and he was also meeting with uh, Einstein to have like this like more clear picture of nothingness and actually when I'm, when I'm thinking if he would live today also he would be interested in brain and astrophysics and also I don't know if you know but uh, <laughs> but also my work is I think connected also with this capturing uh, vibrations and seeing them around us as the brain uh, per se is not only the the share the, the the body because we have this mind field around our brains where the fast thinking is happening actually and some people they think even that we have like kind of like black holes similar points in this brain that is connected us to different dimensions so I know this, this sounds crazy but uh, this, this is like the new Science, scientists that they giving us this, uh, these propositions to, to look, look, but I think that there is something incredible in, in humans, you know, that we have through our magnetic uh, field, um, we are connected with everything that it is. We are connected. Our brains are really also interfering. We all are in unity. So and. Like Johnny Mitchell said, you are on this cosmic dust. You know this song from uh, Woodstock. You're what we are, stardust. Yeah, we, we are, are stardust. stardust. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I was wondering, should we see if we have some questions? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Jason, I'm so excited. I had something to add. Um, I didn't want to interrupt though. So, can I talk? Can I raise my hand? So, the conversation that you, you were just having about um, alchemy mm -hmm. and artists and everything else. So, uh, it reminded me of this article that I pushed on my uh, students when I'm teaching painting. Uh, it was published in July of 2014, and it's about creativity and the artist's mind and how this woman, she teaches at Iowa. Um, she's, been, she's a psychiatrist and also a neuroscientist, which studies the brain. Mm -hmm. And she's been doing research for about 30 years um, on gauging creativity in people. You can look it up, it's actually archived, it's amazing. And um, she studies writers, uh, poets, and um, artists, musicians, the mad scientist. And uh, so we, they all have a connection together. And one of the things I want to mention was said about your paintings and about painting in general is that it's the artist's job, as I think she writes that in the paper, to take what is real and uh, transform it into something not real, like into the imaginary, into a dreamlike state. And uh, yeah, 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 so sure. okay, yeah. And so like the fact that artists or the creative or whatever, like whether you're a mathematician or like an astrophysicist, what you're doing is like you're basically thinking of uh, something that has never been thought of before, never really been seen. So like the motherfucker who came up with like an iPhone, like a touch screen, that had never been done before, right? So like somebody had to think that up. Like, wow, that had never, that had didn't exist. That was never, that, someone had to be like, wow, and like really think outside the box. And that's what creative people do. Like if you're gonna be an accountant, no offense if you are accountants, like that's something simple, <laughs> like not simple, but like that's like that's like thing, that's, that's something that has like an answer that's like right or wrong, like the math doesn't add up. But like to be creative, like you really gotta think like beyond, you know, like relativity and then I just talked about the quantity of it, and like Einstein. And like all these other people, so like to be a mad scientist, you know, that's also creative. Yeah, yeah exactly. Like, it's really fascinating. It's yeah. fantastic. It's yeah. a great article. You should read it. The Atlantic. It's archived. So um, we are all in this realm of taking what is real, 
transforming it into a dream line, a never before seen place. Just don't get trapped there, because you'll forget to pay your cable. is also just half influenced by the artist and it's um, really material that you expose to certain conditions and these conditions yeah. as a whole lead to the surface of the cortein and to me it seems like your work is um, a very similar approach where you kind of orchestrate material into certain conditions um, aggregate states mm -hmm. and gravity and all these laws of nature that have to play in together mm -hmm. and that's why I want to also respond to you because I'm wondering if your work might be not a real condition that's translated into a dream space, what would you call it? Or, or something imaginary? Mm -hmm. Or if it's more like a seismograph of actual real condition like i'm wondering if do you see yourself as somebody who kind of records these conditions and these laws of nature or do you want to overcome these natural forces or do you so do you want to display them or do you want to do you work with them or do you want to control them Zen or is it Faustian? Oh, yeah, <laughs> exactly. I have to say, exactly. I am like a gardener. Gardener doesn't yeah. control really because we just think that the gardening is something that we control. No, but this is like working together with nature. So, you know, there are lots of elements that you don't have any uh, any control of. It's like, it's like I can. Yeah, I, I can I can control like certain things, you know. I mean, uh, make sure that the material that I'm working is uh, is right, you know. And uh, uh, of course, I'm experimenting a lot, like alchemist. <laughs> but what what is really um, uh, important in my work it's this quality of energy. So like this this state that I am in. And that's what I, I try maybe to say about our brain and our connection and interconnection uh, that, you know, in the right state of my body and mind, I am able, you know, to pass something, you know, and I think that this is really connected with con consciousness and uh, I am kind of like trying to to work with resonance, consciousness. So I don't know if it's very clear because this, 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 this is what I'm doing. It's like I think that my consciousness is actually influencing in some ways the, the process. But it's also captured in the result, right? Yes, I, I think that it's like passing from also. It's just not mine. It's like it's interesting what you said that you don't see my gesture there, yeah? Because I am kind of like working together, so it's like because painting makes itself like it doesn't make itself. It's like working together, you know. So it's like kind of like cooperation, <laughs> and the light actually plays enormous role because this is photos, yeah? Like uh, it's also like a coded message somewhere, you know in this light. So I kind of believe that, I'm not sure of course, you know, but uh, these paintings, they, they um, sometimes they, they really surprise me. They, uh, they support me or sometimes they just like, uh, I, sometimes I can't even look at them. And we had this conversation with, I think, uh, Heather that after many years I take the painting that I was like, I mean, I just couldn't look at it. It was so strong for me that I just couldn't look at the painting for several years. And 
at some point I was like, oh, wow, okay, now, you know, I can put it on the wall and it was supporting my energy. And at some point, okay, it passed and it passed to someone else, for example. So I'm just saying it's, it's kind of like a cooperation. Um, speaking, speaking of the light and, and our experience, you know, how you invited us in the beginning to look at the work in the dark with our phones, I'm just I'm trying to picture what um, what's the natural habitat for these beings. Like, um, if you could design an ideal environment in which they live and how how an audience interacts with them, could you describe that? Um, so usually in the, in the the New Zealand they 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 are well lit 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 yeah well lit lit, lit. 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 and uh, they have. I know, guess I guess I'm I'm asking the question a little more conceptually, like because mm -hmm. um, they you seem to um, they seem to inspire a more kind of almost meditative or spiritual mm -hmm. encounter. Or, um, I don't know. I, I guess I'm, I don't have a specific question. I just I, I want I want to in, imagine how they would ideally be interacted with. I guess up to you <laughs> <laughs> to interact with. Would you? Um, but I think that the the. I like uh, actually, you know, it was just by chance that uh, that, that it happened. I had a, a, an exhibition uh, in my hometown, and it, it was an exhibition in, in the big room, but there was not the, the right light because you know the Świetlówki. Uh, I don't know, Jason, what it was. Fluorescent light. It doesn't work at all uh, with with this painting. So I asked. Uh, the director, you know, just to switch light, and uh, and we were going for phones, and I, I really liked that uh, that experience, and I liked people having this direct contact with with them, and uh, this this kind of like uh, surprise also. They, however, I liked them in my in my studio in Warsaw when um, they are like they are, and then suddenly there is like a rays of sun that it's coming on them for a moment and they just like come alive so that's their natural environment in my studio yeah but then it's up to the the, the viewer to to see them uh, in many uh, ways because they change each time uh, with different light uh, and Space, so. but it's true. It's 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 a it's it's a tricky it's, it's a tricky thing with with these paintings and the light. And Joanna, your relationship to scale because you these are small ones, but you also mm -hmm. do very very large paintings. Yes. So um, is the process the same except that it's expanded in a in a larger mm -hmm. surface? Uh, so um, I like uh, like human scale uh, paintings uh, in this kind of paintings, and I really like that because then I can really truly have a gesture, and um, and I like the whole process. Um, uh, but I am working also on the big scale paintings, like three meters, forty, four meters, five meters. Uh, large and they are from the series elements and they are completely different because they are not pouring painting they are gravitational paintings because they are with dots but this paint th these paintings are with like kind of like dancing you know so they are very uh, active uh, they are kind of precise you know but uh, because this is a splattering so it's not like going like pollock you know with the, with um, like this, it's like with dots, but it's it's a very interesting process also, you know, and movement, and uh, I like actually working on the floor as well, but that's the other series. <laughs> 
I just mm -hmm. want to quickly say, um, I think um, when she was asking about the way in which we really want the paintings mm -hmm. to be exhibited, what's your preference? Maybe think of the Rockford Chapel? Right? Yeah, I was thinking the same thing yeah. in, the, part of the, in the Rockford, in the, if you don't know, it's the, you probably all do, in, in Houston, the Manila Museum. The, the, the story, though, where it's this um, uh, sort of non-denominational chapel-like space with these paintings that Rothko made towards the end of his life. And, um, and you know, I think Rothko, it's like, that those are very slow paintings. Like, you go in, and at first, that they seem to be, there's almost nothing there. They're almost like flat paintings. And it's only with time that they gradually, the images begin to emerge. And I think, like, there is this, there was a show some years ago at PS1 called uh, Slow Painting. And I think that your, your painting certainly would qualify as slow paintings, that they are, you know, it's not, and it's the kind of, you know, I think that in the last couple of decades, I think there's, because the, uh, a lot of art has been so influenced by where it's mostly shown and consumed, which is art fairs. And in art fairs, you like, you want something that's sort of shiny, bright, is going to grab someone as they're walking down the um, aisle. And I think that uh, this seems to be very, very different. And uh, I think about just about Rothko, there was a story that Rothko had made a, um, he'd been commissioned to make a series of paintings for the Four Seasons restaurant in New York. And he, um, he'd been working, the paintings were almost done, and he went to have lunch uh, at the Four Seasons. And as he's sitting there watching, listening and watching all these people have lunch and they're talking and they're like, I mean, you know, is this is like, I guess the early 60s in New York and they're probably having like three martinis and there's like the clatter and noise and distraction. He realized like, there is no way in the world that I want my paintings to be in this space. So he withdrew from the commission and those are the paintings that actually ended up going to the Tate Gallery in London you can go and there's a beautiful room in the Tate with those. But that, that sense of like, what is the, this is why it's an interesting question, like what is, you know, where do paintings as objects, as experiences belong? Where in our society, what are the possible places where they could be? And, you know, painting is a very, very piece. There are like, there are paintings that, you know, that, that address completely different issues and, and require a different kind of approach. So, um, and it can be difficult, I think, for, for the viewer, for the person who's kind of shepherding the paintings and, and maybe, I don't know, like, is this something really for the artist to think about? You know, because you can't, you know, ideally, this is what Rothko wanted to do, was to be able to control where his paintings were and how they're experienced. And is that something, like, you know, can you, artists try to control, but at a certain point, it's very frustrating. Yes, yes, and um, yeah, uh, Rothko wanted to uh, to be uh, the viewer close to the painting, like relatively close, so the, the whole painting is like overwhelming the person. And yeah, I would love that too, also, because I was very much interested by color, by theory of color um, at the time. I'm still, but uh, I was obsessed with color, really. And uh, the actual like um, way uh, how color works on uh, on us. So we have like lots of theories, but not a lot of real research. So there was uh, one person from Caltech. Christoph Koch, who was doing experiments uh, on uh, the, the blue and the yellow. And, um, and for example, uh, he came up with, uh, with results that uh, the yellow is actually calming color. It's, the, the organism is calming down and the blue is like activating. Uh, so I was always wondering how you know color is reacting with people but stripped of the cultural background and is it possible or not so i was just like 
always thinking, you know, so how these big paintings like Rothko's paintings work on a person? Besides, you know, all this uh, imaginary, but like in the like physical level, like the the the, the length of the light, you know, the frequencies, how these are putting us, what, what's going on, you know? Is this like putting us to the kind of shifting our emotional, physical state, you know? Maybe you know something. Maybe you were interested in this, in the color and, uh, you know, how, how this working on us. Have you been? Uh, no, I haven't. Uh, same with the Chinese. I mean, the but yeah, the science yeah. Like, kind of like, uh, approach art is, you know, with no mm -hmm. sense of its. But I was thinking about Rothko's in that sense, and also I was thinking about my paintings. You know, what's what's going on beside this, like, you know, uh, maybe secret, mysterious reactions that we have with the painting, but also in like emotional, physical, also level. So, um, so, are you? Would you suggest that we look at your paintings very close up? <laughs> but if you look at, oh, you know, in terms of color, if you look at Joseph Albers, Albers, and Mark Rothko, you know, the use of color is fundamental in both, but the effect is completely different. Yes. So I'm not an, I'm not a painter I'm not an artist but you know the effect is so different and uh, the you know the the scientific uh, research on you know the effect of colors you know Rothko could be using yellow and Albers could be using the same yellow but the effect could be completely different mm -hmm. I would imagine on you know the way you, you kind of perceive it mm -hmm. because they're fundamentally painting in a completely different way. Mm -hmm. Right, it's the, the, the color is just one component yes. of the painting. There's the, you know, there's the surface, there's the, you know, whether there are forms or shapes or right. relationships, and there's the thickness of the support, there's the, um, I mean, there's just all kinds of things that like, you can't separate them, and which is, I think, that's what's great about painting. Mm -hmm. so it, 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 it's, a cohesive something that can't, once you take it apart, it, it, it's something different. Mm -hmm. um, so, are there any other? Uh, it's just like one comment I have when you're talking about the colors and the light, and how the artwork is very much influenced by the context or the surrounding of the building and the architecture, and how, for example, if you display it on a white wall, it will look differently than displaying it on um, a, a concrete wall or a gray wall or any other color. And it's just <coughs> something I find interesting that if we look at architecture and how buildings are designed and how they affect um, how we perceive an artwork or how light and shadow Blue, blue, blue skylights would affect um, painting, but also sculptures and shadows. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, uh, I'm just thinking about, to think about the Middle Ages again, the European Middle Ages is where, you know, and um, where painting and architecture were essentially one thing. Like, mm -hmm. And before painting became this mobile um, uh, object that can be moved from one space to another, where I mean, like in some ways, like with the sort of Rothko, like a lot of other artists are trying to sort of re recapture, like find again that unity of architecture and painting, and it's you know it's really rare that that happens. But I think um, I can certainly see your work having some relationship with it. So, um, if you, do you have anything that you uh, Yeah, I will, yeah, I will have, I will have uh, one question because for me it's just simply very inter interesting how, because 
you have such a big knowledge of art history and uh, you know, I mean, how would you place my painting in, a, in, in an abstract painting, for example? I mean, would you? Would you? There is, is there like uh, something that is coming uh, to your mind, for example? Uh, is the place comparison? Because, you know, I mean, I was, and that was very interesting also, because uh, Richard Serra, he, he, when you see his, uh, his uh, surfaces of his sculptures, you can, you can sometimes um, see that these forces of fluidity are also in the metal, so in this, in, in this case pigments, they have some kind of like uh, aesthetic uh, visual relationship. You know, but uh, also, for example, um, there are lots of artists that they're doing like pouring paintings, but I don't like really relate to them. However, for example, Pat Steer is also, I didn't see her work like in person. I, during one art fair, I saw like uh, what she was doing, but it was like really far from what I am doing. But she's also using. The, the, I guess, turpentine and oil. I, I'm not sure about that. Yeah. Well, I mean, there's, you know, there's a whole school of process painting, mm -hmm. abstraction, process-based abstraction that emerged in the 70s, early 70s. And, and I think that your work has sort of some similarities to that. But I think also you're coming, you don't, you have arrived at this through a different kind of experience and the yeah, direction. So I don't really think about this work as, you know, sort of that, the, the, the process painting, which was so based on you know, sort of experimenting with materials and, um, and I think that, you know, in some ways I think about maybe an artist who wouldn't, on the face of it, seem related to the work of German painter Zygmunt Polka. And in particular, the paintings that Polka did for the Venice Biennale, to come back to Venice again mm -hmm. in um, 1987, he um, created these large, very large, in the German pavilion, uh, Western pavilion, very large murals, and he used pigments that were sensitive to the degree of humidity in the air. And that, so they would change color depending on how humid or dry it was. So in the morning, these paintings would have this kind of like a sort of uh, a sort of greenish hue to them. And by the end of the day, when it's like Venice and things are like the, the weather stream has gotten much hotter, they would like start to turn blue. I'm like, and maybe I don't have the colors exactly right, but this idea of um, and uh, so I think like that, that there's and, and Polka of course was really was interested in. Uh, even though he was in some ways a very sort of uh, critical, <laughs> cynical um, demolisher of the pretensions of painting, he's of course the artist who made this painting with um, a little kind of a black triangle in the upper right corner of the painting, and he titled the painting Higher Spirits Commanded Me to Paint the Upper Corner Right, which was a sort of uh, parody of um, sort of the spiritual painting. But at the same time, he was, I think, increasingly like, became more interested in the you know, ideas of alchemy and you know, the idea of the, the artist as someone who has Transformer. who transforms them. So like, I think that there are, there are ways in which it's like, I think, maybe not look just at the surface similarities, but think about the more um, deeper, less evident. Any other questions? Hmm? So I think that, um, yeah, so thank you so much for accepting the invitation mm -hmm. and uh, for this conversation. Thank you, Natalie. Thank you. For inviting Both us. Both of you. Thank you. It was great. Thank you. Thank you for coming. I'm very grateful that you're here with us. And